Welcome to this podcast of the Florida Historical Quarterly. My name is Daniel Murphy, and I am assistant editor of the journal. If you are new to these podcasts, please visit the Florida Historical Quarterly on Facebook, where you can now access abstracts of each article in the current issue of the journal. In 2016, the FHQ will continue publishing a series of six special issues in recognition of the quincentennial of Ponce de Leon's first visit to Florida in 1513. Next year's special issues are dedicated to Florida history during the 19th century. The first, covering the years 1800 to 1870, will be guest edited by James Kuzik, curator of the P.K. Young Library of Florida History at the University of Florida Library. The second, covering the years 1870 to 1920, will be guest edited by John David Smith, professor of history at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Please look forward to publication of these issues in 2016. Today's podcast features an interview with Dr. Laura Brock, Director of External Relations at the Florida State University College of Medicine. Earning an undergraduate degree in political science, master's degree in public administration, and PhD in religion, Laura has spent much of her life working with Florida legislators in different public and private capacities. In today's interview, Dr. Brock and I discuss her article titled, Religion and Women's Rights in Florida, an Examination of the Equal Rights Amendment Legislative Debates 1972 to 1982, that was recently published in the summer 2015 issue of the FHQ. Can you introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a little bit about your academic background? Sure. My name is Laura Brock, and I am currently the Director of External Relations for the Florida State University College of Medicine, and I've worked in state government in Tallahassee for over three decades. I work for two Supreme Court Chief Justices, two Governors, Martinez and Childs, five Secretaries of what was known then as the Department of Health and Rehabilitative Services, also known as HRS, and several times for the Florida Legislature, including for the House Republican Office when there were only 44 Republicans, and for Daniel Webster, the first Republican Speaker of the House in 122 years, I also worked as Chief of Staff for FSU President T.K. Weatherall. All my academic degrees are from Florida State University. I have an undergraduate degree in political science and a master's degree in public administration. I also have a master's degree in religion with a focus on religion and politics. And finally, I have a Ph.D. in religion with a focus on American religious history. And the article for the Florida Historical Quarterly is actually a distilled version of my dissertation. Wow. Well, I, I, it sounds like you're certainly qualified to uh, be doing what you're doing. That's, that's awesome. You've done a, a lot of stuff. Um, I, I have to tell you, um, we're, the, all of us here in the uh, FHQ offices are really excited about this article because we, 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 we think it's really good. But um, to try to kind of get down to uh, some specifics, can you just – first summarize the general ERA movement in the 1970s and 80s and kind of what motivated you or prompted you to study it? I'd be happy to. I, um, I'll start by explaining what prompted me to study the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, which is also referred to, by the way, as the ERA. Uh, in the ni- late 1970s, I was just finishing my studies in public policy and working at the Capitol and there were masses of women in red and green who were filling the elevators and jamming the hallways. And at the time, I considered myself a part of the religious right, so I sympathized with the viewpoints of the ERA opponents who were dressed in red. But then a few years later, when I worked for the House Republican Office and then as an HRS lobbyist, I developed friendships with several of the legislators who had been on the other side of the issue and supported the ERA. Uh, such as Representative Elaine Gordon, uh, Representative Elaine Bloom, Senator Eleanor Weinstock, and uh, others. And because of these relationships, I came to understand the viewpoint of the ERA supporters as well as the opponents. Uh, They shared their war stories with me at B. Merrill's restaurant over wings, hamburgers, french fries, and glasses of wine. So both sides of the ERA battle were totally convinced that they had a moral or religious imperative for their position. And these were equally well-intentioned legislators who passionately believed for religious or moral reasons that they were right. So years later, 
I decided to dig deeper into the role of religion in the ERA battle. I also chose a topic because it, I think it shows the link between the past and current conflicts over social policy in today's Florida legislature. And to place this in political, cultural, and historical context, Florida in the 1970s and 1980s had what Tom Dye called a fractured political geography. Democrats ran the Florida legislature, but there was a geopolitical ideological ideological split between the South Florida progressives and the North Florida conservatives. The North Florida conservatives, also referred to as the pork chop gang, were the legislative leaders who held a socially conservative ethic found in most southern states. The general ERA movement in the 1970s began with early momentum in 1972 after Congress passed the ERA. 38 states were needed to ratify the amendment. And at first, states raced to ratify the ERA. The Hawaii legislature ratified it in just 32 minutes after it passed Congress. In Florida, House Judiciary Committee Chairman Sandy Dallenbert and his staff director, Janet Reno, had the ERA ready to go. There was harmonious support in the Florida House of Representatives, so the ERA passed overwhelmingly by 84 to 3, but the Florida Senate did not take it up. So that first year, 22 states ratified the amendment, and then a backlash began in 1973, and groups on both sides began intense lobbying, placing media ads, holding marches, and mobilizing letter-writing campaigns. And through the rest of the 70s, one chamber or the other heard the ERA, and either the House or the Senate defeated it by just a few votes. The pro-ERA movement in the 1980s was really knocked back on its heels when the nation in Florida shifted more to the right with the election of Ronald Reagan as president. Although the battle continued in print and over the airwaves in Florida, the ERA was not considered again until Governor Bob Graham called a special session right before the national ratification deadline in June of 1982. The ERA again passed the House 60 to 58 and died in the Senate 16 to 22. The opposition succeeded in blocking passage of the ERA in three crucial battleground states, including Florida. So ironically, uh, the ERA movement in the 1970s and 1980s stimulated support of women's issues in the legislature. For example, uh, Barbara Palmer told me a great story. She is now the Secretary of Florida's Agency for Persons with Disabilities. But when she was FSU Director of Women's Athletics back in 1978, she had a meeting with Senator Dempsey Barron and his colleagues, and Barbara asked, for increased funding for women's athletic programs. And she said the senators were so happy that she was not there to talk about the Equal Rights Amendment that they gladly granted her request for funds. Because of the ERA, they were under pressure to show legislative support for women through other means. So the general ERA movement in the 1970s and 1980s actually stimulated the passage of laws addressing credit parity, marriage rights, insurance equity, and female property ownership. That's uh, it's, it's interesting the way you describe that, and it's also it's interesting in your article. Um, a lot of what you, you you describe are some of the um, what I would call talking points, but the rhetoric of of both sides and how they kind of characterize the debates and their their uh, perspectives. Um, Based on all of that you you researched when it came to the rhetoric, was there any particular theme or any instances, events, anything like that that kind of had the greatest impact on Florida's legislators? Well, the ERA battle, battle was basically the poster child of public policy polarization. So this conflict happened within the context of larger societal culture wars. So the two themes that had the greatest impact on legislators were the family themes and the states' rights themes. And it's important to remember that now, as then, in the legislative arena, certain principles still prevail. First, it's easier to kill a bill than to pass a bill. And second, when social policy legislation is considered, simplistic rhetoric and moral language are often used to label bills as good or bad. 
So the first influential theme, the family theme, was effective because opponents used it to label the ERA as a bad anti-family resolution. ERA supporters tried to show it was a good amendment by demonstrating support from religious or organizations. Opponents were more successful at persuading legislators to vote against it. They said the ERA was an attack on the traditional family and would result in what was called a parade of horribles. And this would include religious concerns about the possibility of legalized homosexual marriages, gay adoption, unisex bathrooms, increased abortions, and women serving in combat duty and sharing foxholes with men. Uh, the second theme that had an impact on legislators at the time was the states' rights theme. Some legislators were concerned that ERA would dilute state legislative powers through judicial interpretation. And this was also triggered uh, the festering resentment of many Florida legislators because of the Brown versus Board Education, Bell Board of Education's decision requiring school integration. On, on the one hand, uh, legislative opponents did not want the ERA to empower courts to tell them what to do for women. And on the other hand, that was exactly what ERA supporters would hope, were hoping would happen because of the many rights they gained that came from court decisions. Well, I, I think I, I, I kind of know the answer to my next question, but um, I'll ask it anyway because I think a lot of uh, listeners will be interested. In your FHQ article, you indicate that many of the issues that shaped the ERA debate uh, in Florida then are still being argued in Florida today. Can you explain or talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. This is the joy of studying history, showing the connections between the past and the present. A direct line can be drawn from the issues in the ERA battle to today's social issues. And ironically, the political mix of the legislature was entirely different than today. Yet these issues are basically the same. Uh, during the decade that ERA was debated, Democrats were in a majority in the House, Senate, as well as in the governor and cabinet offices. In 1972, of 120 members in the House, 38 were Republicans and two were women, and 82 were Democrats and two were women. The 48-member Senate had 15 Republicans, including one woman, and 32 Democrats with no women. Since then, Florida's political geography has shifted, although there have been two presidential electoral wins resulting in two eight-year terms. Since the late 1990s, Republicans have gained a foothold in state leadership. And since 1972, the numbers of Democrats and Republicans have totally flipped. In addition, there are more female legislators. So in 2015, the governor and three cabinet members are Republicans. The House has 81 Republicans, 15 are women, and 38 Democrats, 12 are women. The 40-member Senate has 27 Republicans, 6 are women, and 14 Democrats, also 6 are women. So Given the sea change in the political landscape since 1972, I'll give you a couple of examples of issues that are still being argued in Florida today. First, in the ERA battle, opponents claim the amendment would open the door for gay adoption and same-sex marriage. Fairly recently, courts have ruled in favor of gay adoption, striking down a statutory prohibition and making it legal in Florida. In the 2015 legislative session, an amendment was added to an adoption bill to codify that decision, resulting in intense legislative debate. So the bill passed because it was an important adoption measure that was supported by the governor and the legislative leadership. Governor Scott signed the bill but urged the legislature to create an exemption for religious agencies if they decide not to place children in homes with same-sex parents because of religious beliefs. Also, state and federal courts struck down Florida's ban on same-sex marriages, and then last June, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled 5-4 to four that same-sex couples have a right to marry in all 50 states. About 100 or so bills have already been pre-filed for the 2016 legislative session. There are two bills that are excellent examples of legislation coming from the very same concerns voiced by ERA supporters and opponents. 
The first is a bill that prohibits discrimination against persons on the basis of sexual orientation, Senate Bill 120. The second is a bill known as the Pastor Protection Act, Senate Bill 110, which says that pastors, churches, or religious organizations are not required to conduct any marriage if doing so would violate a sincerely held religious belief. And the second example is the conflict over states' rights versus federal government encroachment. And this is a theme that's been around since the founding days of our nation. Uh, in the ERA debate, senators like Dempsey Barron argued that the ERA would radically shift powers away from the states to the federal government through judicial interpretation and agency actions. These concerns have also driven recent executive and legislative decisions to sue the federal government or to turn away federal funds that require state matching funds. The past two state attorneys general and current governor have joined many lawsuits against the federal government. For example, they joined other states in a lawsuit against the Affordable Care Act. The state attorney general also joined litigation against President Barack Obama's immigration executive order, against gay marriage, against medical marijuana, and against the federal overreach of the Environmental Protection Agency. Also, in the 2015 regular and special legislative sessions, the governor and the House strongly opposed Senate efforts to use federal Affordable Care Act Medicaid expansion funds to provide health care coverage to certain low-income Floridians. The long and acrimonious legislative debates showed that their opposition was largely based on preservation of states' rights and contempt for the federal government. So more than 85% of legislation is non-controversial and passes unanimously. However, given the current political dynamics, we are probably going to see even more conflict over social issues and states' rights in Florida. Yeah, it's uh, what, what your article, what, what you just explained and what your article does really well is uh, we always try to get students to see the connections between the past and the present, and your article does that really, really well. It's, 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 it's fascinating. Um, I could ask you questions all day about this, but I'll just, uh, my last question will be, is there anything else you would like our audience to know about your article or your research? Yes, I ended the article by talking about rejuvenated efforts for ERA ratification that are happening now. Uh, last February, Patricia Arquette concluded her acceptance speech for Best Supporting Actress by urging women to continue the fight for equal rights. Also, there are others calling for ERA passage this year. For example, a new ERA coalition recent, uh, recently opened an office in Washington, D.C., and actress Emma Watson addressed the United Nations and launched a campaign for gender equality. In May, uh, Congresswoman Carol Maloney and Congresswoman Cynthia Loomis, along with 170 bipartisan co-sponsors, reintroduced the ERA. And on her 66th birthday in June, actress Meryl Streep wrote every member of Congress a personal letter asking them to pass the ERA. So finally, in Florida, Senator Arthenia Joyner has already pre-filed the ERA for the 2016 legislative session. So it should be interesting to see how these efforts unfold in the current political environment. Hmm. Yeah, it will be interesting. And needless to say, we have not heard the last of uh, the ERA. <laughs> Um, well, Dr. Brock, thank you very much for speaking with us today. Your article is, is really uh, it's interesting. It's, 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 we, we, we've really enjoyed it here in the FHQ offices, but we really appreciate you speaking with us and um, uh, keep doing this kind of research because it's very, very important. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for joining our international audience for this podcast of the Florida Historical Quarterly. The Florida Historical Quarterly is the peer-reviewed scholarly journal of the Florida Historical Society. The Society was founded in 1856 and is the only statewide historical organization in the state of Florida. The Society is headquartered in Cocoa, Florida, and the editorial offices of the journal are in the Department of History at the University of Central Florida. I hope you have enjoyed the Florida Historical Quarterly podcast and that you would consider supporting future scholarship on Florida history by becoming a member of the Florida Historical Society. We also invite researchers to access back issues of the Florida Historical Quarterly on JSTOR. Thank you again for listening to the Florida Historical Quarterly Podcast. 
If you enjoy listening to this interview and know of others who enjoy history, please tell them about the podcast and have them find us on Facebook. <laughs>